Picture this. Kareem sits in a coffee shop staring at his laptop with visible frustration. This Wi-Fi is terrible, he mutters. The coffee's cold. And why is this place so loud? His friend Cosmo, sitting at the next table, can't help but notice. Dude, Cosmo observes, you've complained about something every five minutes for the past hour. Kareem pauses, defensive. I'm not complaining, I'm just observing. But what if I told you that Kareem's brain is doing something far more complex than just being negative? What if complaining isn't weakness, but a sophisticated psychological strategy that's been hardwired into us for survival? To understand this, let's meet Dr. Petsy, a neuroscience researcher who spent years studying something most of us do dozens of times a day, but rarely understand. When Petsy looks at brain scans of people who are complaining, she sees something fascinating. Three distinct brain networks activate simultaneously. The emotional processing center lights up. The social cognition network fires. And surprisingly, the problem-solving regions start working over time. Back in that coffee shop, when Cosmo asks, so you're telling me there's actual science behind why some people seem to complain about everything? Petsy's research has a clear answer. Actually, yes, and it's more fascinating than you think. The experiment in 2019, researchers at UCLA conducted what they called the complaint study. They wanted to understand why humans evolved this seemingly negative behavior. They took 200 people and put them in mildly frustrating situations, broken printers, slow elevators, cold rooms. But here's the twist. Half were allowed to complain out loud. Half had to stay silent. Imagine if Kareem and Cosmo were part of this study. The researchers give them both a deliberately difficult puzzle with missing pieces. Kareem, assigned to the complaining aloud group, immediately starts venting. This is impossible. Half the pieces are missing. Who designed this thing? Meanwhile, Cosmo, forced to stay silent, struggles quietly, his frustration building with no outlet for expression. After 20 minutes, something remarkable happened. The complainers, like Kareem, didn't just feel better. They actually performed better on subsequent tasks. When Dr. Petsy analyzed the brain scans, she discovered why. When Kareem complained, his brain was doing three things simultaneously. First, it was regulating his emotional state, literally cooling down his amygdala, the brain's alarm system. Second, it was seeking social connection, hoping someone would validate his experience. And third, it was problem-solving. His complaints were actually his brain's way of analyzing what was wrong and preparing for action. What it means. But here's where it gets really interesting. The researchers found that complaining activates the same neural pathways as both stress relief and social bonding. So when Cosmo later complains about his job to his friends, he's not just venting. His brain is literally trying to connect, saying, I'm experiencing something difficult and I need to know I'm not alone in this. But what about people who seem to complain about everything constantly? This is where that powerful quote comes into play. What you are not changing, you are choosing. Chronic complainers often get stuck in what psychologists call learned helplessness. Their brain has learned that complaining feels good in the moment, but they never move to the action phase. Dr. Petsy's research shows that healthy complaining has three distinct stages, emotional release, social connection and problem identification. Unhealthy complaining gets stuck in an endless loop of just the first two, never reaching that crucial third stage where real change begins. Real world application. So how can you tell if your complaining is helping or hurting you? Dr. Petsy suggests asking yourself one simple question. After I complain, do I feel motivated to change something or do I just want to complain more? Think about Kareem's Wi-Fi complaint. After venting his frustration, he actually switched to his phone's hotspot. That was productive complaining that led to action. But if Cosmo spends an hour complaining about his boss, without ever considering looking for a new job or having a conversation about his concerns, that's when complaining becomes a substitute for action instead of a catalyst for it. The research reveals something fascinating. People who use complaining as a first step toward problem solving show increased activity in their prefrontal cortex, the brain's executive center, responsible for planning and decision-making. 
but chronic complainers show more activity in the limbic system, the emotional, reactive part of the brain that keeps us stuck in feeling mode rather than action mode. So the next time someone calls you a complainer, you can tell them you're actually engaging in a complex neurological process that helped our species survive. Though as Kareem might joke, maybe don't complain about people calling you a complainer. That might be getting a little too meta. But here's the real question we'll explore in our next episode. If complaining is so natural and even beneficial, why do some people seem to do it constantly while others barely complain at all? And what happens when complaining becomes less about solving problems and more about building alliances, creating tribes and sometimes tearing them apart? Next time we'll dive into the social side of suffering and discover how your complaints might be doing more than just helping you. They might be reshaping your entire social world.